What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. We're in Philippians chapter 2. I just want to read to you our text today. It begins like this in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And then he says this interesting phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked, perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So, Lord, we pray that you would open your word in our hearts and our minds and our lives to you, your truth, your presence, your power, your spirit. And, Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your name. Thank you for the freedom to do that. And thank you for the truth of your word that's absolute and never, ever changes. Lord, speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'll never forget arriving in Israel for my very first time. Me and four other guys had a trip planned, and I'd never been there. We landed in the Tel Aviv airport and made our way to the coast. And that night uh, in the hotel, I could look out and see the city of Joppa the southern part of Tel Aviv. It was Joppa, a place I had read about in the Bible. It was that port that, well, you know the story where Jonah was supposed to head for Nineveh to, to Tarshish, but instead he headed for Joppa, and that's where we were. It was where Peter stayed in the house of Simon the Tanner, and he had that that vision, if you remember, when God was trying to awaken Peter's heart to reach the Gentiles. Peter had this vision where this sheet came down with all these animals on it that were unclean. And in the vision, God said to him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, oh boy, Lord, I'm a good Jewish boy. I've never eaten anything unclean. And I'm not starting now. And God said, Peter, what I have cleansed, don't you call unclean. God was doing all this in the city of Joppa. And there we were. And I couldn't wait till the next day because not only were we going to see Joppa, but we were going to go to Caesarea, which was a port city. And it was there that Paul was kept prisoner and and where he sailed from there to Rome, and all kinds of things happened there. A giant amphitheater was there, and we would make our way. Well, we had just arrived, and we were going to make our way through all of Israel. Always read about it. Been to Bible college, seminary, but it had all just been pictures and words on pages. And now we would go to Capernaum, the headquarters of Jesus and his ministry. We'd, we'd actually look at the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus walked on water where Peter was restored. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me, Lord? You know I do. We'd go to that hillside where the Sermon of Mount was given, and 
Jesus spoke to thousands and preached the gospel, we would make our way to the Mount of Hermon where the, well, where Jesus was transfigured. We'd spend time down by the Dead Sea, we'd go to Jerusalem, we'd go to Gethsemane. See, we, we had arrived in Israel. We were there that first night, but there was a huge journey in front of us, a huge experience to be had. And I say all that to say this, that salvation is that way. You come to Christ and you're forgiven. There's this great sense of release from, from guilt and shame. There's an exodus that begins from, you know, your past to a new life in Jesus Christ. As Corinthians says, old things pass away and all things become new. The journey just begins once you come to Christ. What lies before you after you surrender to him is this amazing life that he's called you into. In fact, it's what the Apostle Paul speaks about here in our text. He says in verse 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, Paul is speaking to believers. He's speaking to Christians there in Philippi. And he's not questioning their belief. He's not questioning their salvation. He's challenging them. He's challenging us by the Spirit to work out our salvation, our faith. He's basically saying this. Now it's time to get in the race. Now it's time to grow. Now it's time to to get out there and explore all that God has for you. Now now it's time to to follow Jesus and bear fruit and fulfill your call and your purpose as a believer. And I I want to just pause here for a second and take a sip of water. But also to say this. You can't work out your salvation until you're sure you have salvation. It's not, and and here's the thing, today's message is is kind of going to be more of a teaching than a preaching, And, and I want you to tune in, I want you to listen, because I'm going to try to do my best to explain, how do I know if I'm saved? How can I be sure? See, salvation isn't the thing where I say, well, I I think I've got it. I'm I'm pretty sure I do. Well, I hope so. I got a glow-in-the-dark bracelet from the church. I must be saved, right? I mean, how do you know? There's no reason to try and work out your salvation if you don't have it. You just can't do it. I mean, suppose you were to die today. It happens, right? And you stood before God, and he said to you, well, why why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Oh, I've been a pretty good person. If you got a scale, I think my, my good outweighs my bad. I treat people fairly. I love my family. I pay my taxes. I voted for... (laughs) <laughs> I'll never forget, as a young Christian, I was still living in my parents' home, and my stepdad was not a believer at this time, and he had a carport, and one of the places on the carport was closed off, and inside it was two washing machines and a hot water heater. Well, the hot water heater had rusted out at the bottom, and the water had leaked all over the floor, and it was about you know, this deep, and he said, John, I need you to help me, you know, take this hot water heater out. We're going to put another one in, and I I didn't know anything about, you know, plumbing or soldering, and so here we are wading through the water, and we're kind of got this hot water heater, and it's all hooked up, and and I looked over at him. I said, man, I was a very young Christian, and I said, boy, I'm glad I know I'm saved, because I thought I'm going to get electrocuted standing in this water hanging on to a hot water heater. 
And he looked up at me and he said something. He said, well, that's pretty presumptuous of you to think that you know you're going to heaven. And, and I looked at him and I said, well, you can know. And there's a, there's a scripture in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, that says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So here's the thing. You can know for sure that you have salvation. John says, I, I wrote these things so that you could know. I mean, remember the story of Nicodemus, a moral man, a leader in the community, a respected teacher, loved God's Word, even admired Jesus. He believed in miracles. Nicodemus had all the goods as a religious person. And he, and he came to Jesus, it tells us, at night. And in the Gospel of, of John chapter 3, there's, there's that wonderful story about Nicodemus and, and Jesus, and he, he comes to him and says, uh, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher, come from God, because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And it's like Jesus kind of cut him off right there. He was getting ready to ask him some questions, maybe about his miracles, maybe about, you know, his teachings. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. He stopped him and said, you know, here, here, Jesus must be thinking, here he is, he's a religious leader, he's a spiritual man, he, he, he's probably not coming for salvation. He thinks he's good. He's probably not coming for forgiveness of sins. He keeps the law. He's looking for insight. How's he doing these signs? How's he accomplishing these, these, these miracles and these crowds and this teaching? And how's he doing all this stuff? But he's way ahead of himself. And Jesus stops him. It's like, slow down, Nicodemus. Back up just a little bit. First things first. You've got to be born again. And a lot of people think, well, I, I go to church, I, I got a Bible, I, I was baptized, I was confirmed, but not really sure of their salvation. Not really sure they're, 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 they have eternal life. You cannot work out your salvation until you're sure that you have salvation. You can't be a Christian until you become a Christian. Does that make sense? You, you can't be a Christian until you become a Christian. To work out your salvation, you must know for sure you have it. Without assurance of your salvation, you can't work it out. So here's the question. Do you know for sure you're saved? How do you know that? Can you give good reasons why you know? I, I just want to share some, some simple basic biblical proofs to help you and I understand for sure that you're saved. Number one, you take hold of the promises of God, His Word. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Your assurance, my assurance of my salvation that, and we'll talk about working it out, is based on God's promises, His Word. In the book of Romans, and I'll read this passage to you, Romans speaks of our salvation. In Romans chapter 10, listen to verse 9. It says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. 
If you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You believe in and trust in that he is the Lord in your heart. You confess it with your mouth. Not that he's just a prophet, not that he's a great teacher or a moral example or, or a rabbi or even a miracle worker. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God sent him, that he died on the cross for my sins, that he was raised from the dead. You know, it's like that story in Caesarea Philippi where Jesus asked his men, who do they say that I am? Well, some say you're prophet, some say you're this, some say you're that. Okay, guys, but what do you think? And you know the story. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus made this statement about Peter's confession. He said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's not, Peter, that you're so analytical and perceptive. It's not, Peter, that you're, you've got some spiritual insight that, boy, you're wise. Okay, Peter, you got the question right. You're teaching the next parable. That's not how it went down. He said to him, my father revealed this to you. This is a, a spiritual thing that's happening to you, Peter. It's a revelation by God. God opened your eyes, your heart, to see, to know who I am. And so God will speak by his word. And the Lord begins to open your heart, to give you these spiritual eyes, so to speak, to where you become to the place, you're brought to a place by the word and by his spirit where you would say, you know what? Based on what I've seen and based on what I've heard and based on what's been said to me from God's word, I believe in my heart and I confess with my lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, now, it's not just some inward feeling, but it begins to express itself outwardly. You, you begin to trust in the promises of God. Now, now, please listen. Assurance of salvation begins with being sure about Him. Before you can ever be sure about you. Does that make sense? My salvation begins first by being sure of Him before I can ever be sure about myself being saved. See, everyone has doubts. But what are your doubts about? Do you, do you doubt the gospel? Do you doubt the fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead? Do you, do you have doubts about you know, him being the, the son of God and that, that he, he took your place on the cross? If that's your doubt, if those are your concerns, well, then you need to go to the Lord and you need to ask him to show himself to you. You need to say, Lord, I believe you. Help my unbelief because I believe you will. He wants to. If you go with him with a sincere heart and, and, and really say, Lord, I just don't know if I can believe the Bible. I don't know if I can believe in you. It's kind of like John the Baptist had some doubts. There in prison, you know, had done his thing, was waiting for the Messiah to establish his place here on earth. And he said, you know, he sent a, he sent a message to Jesus. He said, are you the one? Or should I look for someone else? I mean, it was John himself who stood on the Jordan River and said, you know, uh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But well, now, later, he's kind of like, I'm not sure this guy's him. And Jesus sent him a message that took away his doubts. And I would say to you, if you have doubts about who Jesus is, take your doubts to Jesus. Ask him to show himself to you to prove himself to you. See, maybe your doubts aren't about Jesus. 
A lot of people wrestle with doubts, not about the gospel, not about God, but they doubt themselves. They say things to themselves like, gosh, I'm so weak in my faith. I, I stumble a lot. I, 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 I struggle. I, I have these, these issues. And so I wonder, am I really saved? Am I really a Christian? See, see, your doubt may not be about the gospel. It might not be about Jesus. It might not be about, you know, who he is. The, the doubt might be about who you are. Am I, am I really saved? See, it's one thing to doubt Jesus. It's another thing to doubt you. You and I are not saved by being sure of ourselves. So that makes, we're, we're saved about being sure of him. That's where it starts. The story of two men, you know, praying in the temple. A Pharisee, very religious. A tax collector. Not so religious. They're not so religious even today, I don't think, many of those tax collectors. <laughs> but they're in there. And they're praying. And, and, and one of them, the Pharisee, believes, you know, that he's, 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 he's there, he's holy, he's, he's sanctified, and he does all this religious stuff, and he thanks God that he's not like this other man. And the tax collector just has his head down, he's beating his breast, and he's, he's like, God, have mercy on me, you know. And the Bible says that the tax collector went away justified. The other did not. See, if you can nail down your belief and your trust in him first, who he is and what he's done, then you can start finding assurance of your own personal salvation. The first step is knowing him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, the scripture says, shall be saved, shall have life, shall have forgiveness, shall have pardon, shall have new life in Jesus Christ. Trust in his promises, his word. Place your full assurance in who he is and who the scripture says he is, because here's the truth. God keeps his promises. So if you call upon me, I'll save you. I knock on the door. If you open, I'll come in. Whoever believes upon him, he'll save. How do I know I have salvation? Well, well number one, I can trust in God's word and the promises that God has given. Number two, God gives you an inner witness. Romans chapter 8, listen to these verses. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons or daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, God's Spirit, by which you cry, Abba, Father, or Daddy, you're my Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Number one, I have his promises. Number two, I receive the Spirit of God, and there's like this inner dialogue that begins, his Spirit bearing witness with my Spirit that I belong to him. See, you, see, you trust his promises, you believe the truth of the Scriptures, but God also begins to speak to you by his Spirit to tell you who you are, to convince you of who he is. I, I, I want to read a, a passage of Scripture from the book of Ephesians. Just, just listen. It says this. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Okay, I heard the Scripture. I trusted. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I heard the truth, I believed, and God sealed me, gave to me his spirit. 
And there's this inner witness that goes on where he, he, he convicts me, he speaks to me, and he assures me that he's my father. Jesus told his disciples, those who believed, those who trusted in him, they saw him raised from the dead. He said, now I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, we have this verse, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses to men in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, I, I believe they already knew Jesus, had trusted in Jesus, had seen the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, Jesus had even breathed on them at one time and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And now he says, we're going to do something new in your life with the Spirit. You'll be saved, you'll be my children, you'll, your sins are forgiven, but there'll be a power that comes into your life through the Spirit where you'll have strength and assurance to be my witnesses. So here's the thing. I believe his word. I'm sealed by the Spirit. And the Spirit comes into your life. It's like, I don't want to overemphasize this, but it's like hearing a voice but not hearing a voice as he speaks to you. It's this sense of his presence, this intimacy, this, this closeness, this heartfelt sense of I'm part of God's family and he's my father. It's the promise of God's word and the witness of the Holy Spirit. In the book of John, Chapter 16, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, the helper will not come to you, speaking of the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he'll convict the world of sin and of judgment. And I have many things to say to you, but you can't hear these now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Or he'll not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He'll glorify me, Jesus says, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So Jesus said, I'm going to send my spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. And the truth will comfort you, it'll strengthen you, it'll assure you. When he speaks of the Holy Spirit, he's not talking about some mystical, weird, spiritual experience. But it's just asking, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Let your Spirit guide me into all truth. In the book of Ephesians, the, the Apostle Paul says, do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit. And the verb there is, is like be continually filled with the Spirit. See, here's the question. Are you filled with the Spirit? Have you asked the Lord to fill you with the Spirit? He says he will. In, in, in Luke chapter 11, there, there's this great passage of Scripture where Jesus is speaking. He said... I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. And, and this whole passage is sometimes misinterpreted. He's talking about the Spirit. If a son asks for a bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? If you then, and he says, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let me encourage you, if you know the truth, to ask the Lord to fill you with the Spirit. Now listen, I got saved in a Pentecostal church. I'm not asking you to roll on the ground, speak in tongues and froth. What I'm asking you to do is, instead of getting drunk with wine, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just simply ask, Lord, fill, fill me with the Holy Spirit. 
Give me that sense of, of confidence and, and inner witness that, that I'm, I'm yours, that you know, your spirit bears witness with my spirit, and I can call you Father. That, that's part of the assurance of salvation, having that inner witness. If anyone comes and asks, he says, I'll, I'll give it. And it's not like the same experience for everybody. You know, today it was kind of raining. I came out of my house. It was sort of just drizzling, right? Now, there's, I, I, my wife parks inside the garage. She has this nice little cozy place she puts her car. I'm outside. <laughs> just some of you guys relate to that, I bet. So I got to run to the car. It's kind of raining, but it's, it's barely raining. There's other times, though, when it's not barely raining, and you can just get drenched. And those are two different experiences. And I would say the Holy Spirit's kind of like that. For some people, boy, it's like, bam, it's this big drenching thing. Other people, it's a light drizzle. But the end result is they both get really wet. So, Lord, however you choose, give me the Holy Spirit. Listen, how do I know for sure? How can I work out my salvation if I don't know I have it? Well, first of all, I trust in the promises of his word. Secondly, one of the signs of salvation is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. For my spirit bears witness with his spirit that I'm his child. And the third one I want to talk about, and the reason I made this one last, is because it has to do with lifestyle, and we're not saved by works. We're not saved by the way we live. But if we're saved, our life does change. And it demonstrates a certain lifestyle. It's not based on works, our salvation. But the Bible does say, we know we have passed from death to life if we love the brethren. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother, well, he's dead, is what it says. He's not born again. He's spiritually without life. So one of the signs is we begin to develop also a love for the church, the body of Christ, for his people. See, before I was a believer, I didn't go to church. I didn't even like church people. You may say, I don't like them now. But I thought, well, these people are self-righteous, or this or that, and they, they don't understand how to have fun. Uh, but, but when I got saved, man, I couldn't get enough of church. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I couldn't, couldn't wait to, well, to know him and be obedient to him. And I think there's been believers in my life that I feel closer to them than my own biological family at times because... We have the same belief. We have the same Lord. We're part of the same family. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away. All things become new. In our text, there in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Therefore, my beloved, he loves them. They're part of his spiritual family, as you've always obeyed, as you live this lifestyle of the Christian, not just when I'm around, he says, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, it's not like the word fear and trembling there doesn't mean, well, I'm afraid, I, you know, God's going to strike me down, and, I, you know, if I make a mistake. No, the, the word really means reverence. The, the word really carries a connotation, sincerity, awe, obedience. Th this sense of reverence and awe and obedience, work it out with that kind of sense to the Lord. Walk it out. God wants you to, he says. For it's God who's working in you, verse 13, both to will and do for his good pleasure. See, here's the thing. You arrive. It's called salvation. Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the hotel looking at Joppa. I can't wait to get 
involved in the journey. You get saved. And God, it says here in our text, wants to work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God wants to take your life, this is what he's saying, and, and since you've arrived now, since you have salvation, since you're you know, following him with reverence and obedience and sincerity and all, man, God has this life, this journey that he wants to work through you for his will and for his good pleasure. And the experience, well, he says in verse 14, it should look kind of like doing things without complaining and disputing, murmuring all the time. You know, talk about a joy killer. Don't you love to be around people where they're always complaining, murmuring and disputing? It's like, oh, great, here comes joy killer, most wanted on list. He says, don't, don't be that person. No, no, you want to be blameless, harmless children of God, verse 15, without fault in the midst of a generation that's always murmuring and complaining, among whom you will shine as lights. We live in this crazy culture, this weird place right now that's perverse, that's crooked. So Paul says this, I want you to shine. I want you to stick out. I want you to work out your salvation. I want you to have this reverence and obedience and sincerity and all towards the Lord. And don't get caught up into in all the bickering and complaining that the culture seems to fall into. Because if you do, you'll, you won't shine. I want you to shine like lights. Don't become like the world. You, you, you have the truth. You have God's promises. You have his spirit where you can cry, Abba, Father. You have a changed life, he says, to work out. Let it shine. Live like a light. Holding fast, verse 16, the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain or labored in vain, Paul says. I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I'm glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason that you also be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul would say, be sure of your salvation, yes. Know know the promises of God. Experience the, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Let your life be changed and come before the Lord with reverence and awe and obedience and let your life shine like a light in the midst of this dark and perverse culture. And if you could ever shine like a light, it's now today in a culture that we live in. You know, my wife and I drove down to Panama City yesterday to see this new movie that's out called Jesus Music. I don't know if you've heard of it but it tracks the time of of when the contemporary Christian music started back in the days at Calvary Chapel with Chuck Smith all the way up to today where it's talking about Hillsong and all the different music. And it's very interesting uh, kind of documentary type film. It's not playing any theaters around here, thus we drove to Panama City. But I haven't been in a movie theater in almost two years. So we walked in there and the first thing we saw was uh, a bathroom, which I needed to use quite, quite quickly. <laughs> and it said, unisex. And Lynn goes, oh, unisex? I said, I don't care, I'm going. She goes, you are? <laughs> I go, yeah. <laughs> so I went in and locked the door. And um, Lynn found another restroom that was male and female. But she, she was kind of surprised. And I was too, that the first thing you see when you walk in is a unisex bathroom. Well, the next shocker was, we went up to the concession stand and a bag of large popcorn, and my wife's very frugal, was $22. $22. And we're looking at the, bag, the, the thing, and I'm thinking, Is that, can that be right? And so, so Lynn asked the guy behind the counter, she says, so a bag of large popcorn costs $22? And he goes, yes, ma'am but it comes with two large drinks. And she goes, well, I'm a sticker shock. Give me a second here. 
He, he, go, he goes, well, I'm hearing that all the time. <laughs> but that's a perverse, crooked generation right there, $22. You could have gone out to dinner. But, but you know, we, we, we live in this, this, this crazy world, not just with, with unisex and gender and all the crazy stuff that's going on. And he says, Paul says, this is what I want you to do. Because there's all kind of disputing and stuff going on in the Philippian church. You'll find that out as we get closer to the end. And he's saying, look, in the culture we live in, first of all, recognize you're saved, who you belong to. And this is important for us today, now, in the culture we live in. Know, have assurance of your salvation. I can trust his promises. I have the inner witness. You know, my lifestyle has actually changed. And now begin to work it out for his good pleasure, not for yours, so that you and I might be able to be what God's called us to be, lights in a perverse, dark culture that we live in. He, you know, he, he puts it this way, that we, that we might be able to hold fast the word of light, of life, and that we might shine in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation as lights in the world. Work out your salvation, basically. Not work for it, but work it out. Be glad and rejoice in it. So, so I would close with this question. Do you know for sure you have salvation? Not I hope so, I, I think so, I'm pretty sure. H have you trusted in Christ? Do, do you trust his word? I mean, do you trust the fact that Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock? Yes, in Revelation, he was talking about a church, but he also knocks on the door of people's hearts. And he says, if you open it, I'll come in. And that's what he does. And once he comes in, as you trust what he says is true, then he wants to fill your life with his spirit, and he wants to change your life and the way you live, and he wants to work it out with you and for you and through you that you might shine as a light in this perverse and dark culture that we live in. You know, the Bible says over and over again, Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next week. Well, I'll get around to it. You know, procrastination is one of the greatest tools of the enemy. Jesus was always no today. Make a decision. The enemy says tomorrow. You don't need it. The Lord always says today. He says to those who are who are tired, who are restless, hey, come unto me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You know, I love that story where Jesus comes to the paralytic by the poolside who's been there 38 years, and he asks him the question, would you like to be healed? Oh, well, uh, no, I got this, this, just, no, I didn't ask. I said, would you like to be healed? And I think that's what he does to a person who doesn't know if they're saved, who isn't saved. He reaches out his hand and says, would you like to be saved? Would you like to know for sure? Would you like your sins forgiven? Well, uh, no, I didn't ask you that. Do you want to know me as your Lord and Savior? Because here's what he'll do. He'll heal your life. He'll take away your sin. He'll begin to transform you into the person that he's created you to be. He takes away the pain of the past. He, he removes the judgment that's on your life, and he opens the door to a fresh new experience in life. It's called working out your salvation with fear, trembling, with awe and reverence and obedience. Will you have doubts and struggles? Yeah. But you know what? Those doubts and struggles will be more about you because we all have them. I have tons of doubts and struggles about you. <laughs> and about me. But you know, one thing I've nailed down, my doubts and struggles aren't about him. They're more about me. 
And I'm continuing, and I hope you are too, working out your salvation.